Raising the Bets is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to Raising the Bets, where a Catholic couple raising five kids outside of Boston join us as we share the joys and challenges of marriage, homeschool, and our adventures near and far as we make sense of the world and experience the best parts of our culture. I'm Don Bettinelli. And I'm Melanie Bettinelli. So I want to start with, on, I'm sorry, <laughs> to start a podcast on a downer, but uh, there is a bit of a sad note. Uh, we learned this morning that some friends of ours, some acquaintances, uh, another Catholic homeschooling family that used to live near us and moved slightly further away from us. Uh, they lost their baby last night. A one-year-old uh, son named Angelo drowned in their family pool, and it was uh, very sad. And it, I bring it up because I want to ask everyone to pray for the family. Yeah, please, please pay for the the family. Oh yeah. my gosh, it's like heartbreaking. I mean, the, the the it's in the news, right? The whole thing, so we could right. we could say the name, you know, because it's it's not private anymore. But the the Nicoloro family. Uh, and Kathleen is the mom. She's they have seven kids, and she's she's pregnant with the seventh. Right, due in September. Y- you can imagine how horrible it is. And and we were just talking about when we were swimming, you know, over at my brother's house a few weeks ago, swimming, and we had a baby that ended up in the pool, and they had to dive into to to rescue, and it was a very near thing. And it just uh, reminds me of just how how dangerous pools are. Um, you were saying today, like you would never want a house with a pool. Yeah, not, not something. Uh, I, I would be haunted. Well, by the thought of it. Yeah, the 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 police chief in their town in the news article was saying you have to treat a pool like a bonfire. You can never leave it unattended. You have to watch kids around it constantly. You know, and that's the and he's right. You know, it's just so if you if you can and and honestly. I know that when we take our own kids swimming, I'm not nearly vigilant enough. I mean, it's right. just the, the grace of God that nothing bad has happened to us because I know it's not my vigilance, <laughs> but maybe they're guardian angels. I mean, right. And they're older now, but still, it's, it's, it doesn't mean it's impossible. It's, it's always scary. I mean, right. I, I've, I've no family who, who lost a, a teenager to drowning. So, right. That was in the news recently, was a, a kid at a graduation party, 18 years old, drowned. So, yeah, yeah. So, you know, please say a prayer for the Nick Loro family. Um, so, uh, but moving on to the other things that we were going to talk about, uh, we had a, a pretty good week. It was uh, decent weather here, right? Was it was, it, most of the week wasn't too hot. It was good weather. I yeah, it was very nice weather. We had, a, you know, a little bit of rain, but welcome rain in didn't like it wasn't any day was a washout or anything like that uh we had a beautiful sun shower on tuesday where we had amazing rainbows and lit up clouds it was awesome uh so on friday we managed to get another half day <laughs> i managed to get another half day of uh free free i got my work done early and so we went for another drive and we went back to the daniel webster wildlife sanctuary Right. It's a Audubon. More more like a hike than a drive, actually. Well, we drove to and then hiked. Yes. Sorry. That's what, that's what I mean. And it's funny because I keep wanting to go to new places. And I know you do, too. I do, too. But the kids are all like, no, no, we like the place well, that we know. Well, also, I think that if we were going more frequently, like we would go through all the places that we know, and then maybe they'd be interested in new adventures. But they really do like going back to their favorite places. And yeah, there's something really nice about going back to the same places over and over again and really getting to know them better. Yeah. There's also a lot to be said about exploring new things. I feel like every time, for example, we go to the state park closest to our house, uh, to Ames Noel, they... Um, they always want to go on the familiar trails and they are start to get very resistant on like setting off onto new directions, new trails. And I'm like, I always want to see what's over the next hill. What's over the next bend? What's around the corner? If most kids are like that, they like, they like the familiar, they like the routine. 
They liked the, the the traditional. I mean, I remember as a kid, I, when we would go on vacation, I wanted to go to the same places. That's where we always go for ice cream on the on the Saturday night, or you know what I mean, like that sort of thing. Right. I, maybe that's a maybe that's a part of being a kid. I don't know, but yeah, I, I really I really like the Daniel Webster. It's a it's a bird sanctuary, so there's all kinds of beautiful birds. But it's a beautiful location. It's gorgeous, and it is beautiful. It's not very large, so there's only so much you can see there. You know, it, it's you're only... going for the for the birds. Yeah, I mean the scenery is good too, but you're, you're... right. But once you've been there a couple times, you've kind of seen. Like I I don't mind going back, and I I would like to go back again and. Maybe even in a different season, you know, because it was literally one year apart. <laughs> right. It was, I, I meant this this spring. Just, I was thinking it would be go be nice to go earlier when the birds were first building their nests and to see that part of the. But it just didn't happen. Because this is your third time there. Because I missed one, right? Right. The first time the we first went, time. you weren't with us. Yeah. So, but it was it was still it was still a beautiful day. We we the it wasn't it was warm. So poor Sophie, who melts in the heat, even the slightest heat was was a little warm. But coming back, we were in the woods where it was shaded. I, I, I feel huge sympathy for Sophie because she she does really melt in the heat. But it's kind of funny to me that what she the like the heat that she melts in because as a Texan, I'm thinking it's a gorgeous day. There's such a nice cool breeze. It's not too hot. <laughs> yeah, and I was never too hot. Like. <laughs> I know sweltering, well, oppressive maybe heat. Maybe if you didn't dress in all black. Uh, the girl who overheats so easily wears all black. Right. It's but, like, it's, but, but she would overheat even if she was I know. In all white. I know. Uh, and of course, Bella with her binoculars and like birds everywhere. And she was just a bird, 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 that bird over there. <laughs> it was just funny. And then the others were, were doing their running around thing. The, the three younger ones. And... Uh, <sighs> They kept laying down in the grass, and it's like, don't oh, lay in the grass. No, there no. are ticks. Yeah, Lucy. She got not one. Two. But two ticks. I found, I found a tick on her Friday night when I was doing her hair. And then I found another one this morning. Near this, this Sunday morning, near the same place. Like, how did we miss that? It was not there on Friday night. Yeah. It must have been crawling around on her and then later. Oh, that's so creepy. It. Oh, I hate ticks so poor, much. Poor Lucy. She was so creepy. She out. was so freaked out. Oh, she was so upset. I managed to get them both out whole and entire. So that's good. They were the bigger ones, which makes it easier to get them. It also means they're less likely to be carrying Lyme disease. Right. Right. But we'll have to keep an eye on her. So that yeah, so that part was not so great. But one of my one of the fun things is one of the big, great things about being a dad of kids this age, the the three younger ones especially, is being able to like play games with them because they were getting a little restless because mom and their older sisters were kind of lagging back, and I kept holding them back. And so finally, I came up with a game where we were uh, Star Wars Rebels on patrol, looking out for stormtroopers and. It was hard to get keep them in it, but eventually, I kind of it, it was they were they were never fully immersed in the game. But it's not, because you came up with it, not them, right? But it was enough of a thing to keep them occupied and not bugging you guys and making it, making it terrible for everyone. So that that worked out okay, actually. Uh, but it is kind of fun to play the to enter into their game with them, um, sort of make like make it like a D and D adventure, like a live action D and D. But, mm -hmm. but role or live action role playing because it's not D and D Star Wars. So you're LARPing, exactly. Live action uh, role playing in Star Wars. Oh, imagine if we all had uh, cosplay like uniforms, and we went hiking. That wouldn't be embarrassing at all. <laughs> I think even they would balk at hiking in uniform. Yes, they probably would. <laughs> still <laughs> that would be funny um so yeah so we, we we went on the walk and it was beautiful it was really nice and we saw all kinds of amazing birds we saw the bobolinks and we saw the blackbirds we found an oriole nest yes the orioles and um yeah it was good so and then uh today's father's day didn't do much of anything for father's day i no. just kind of hung out i no. mowed the lawn <laughs> in the heat <laughs> Like a dad. Like a dad. It's it's Father's Day, so that's what you do. Uh, on Saturday, we went to the farmer's market, and then I had to record some episodes of Mysterious World with Jimmy. And uh, they're going to be good ones, folks. Check them out. They were, we did one on the Exodus. Did the Exodus really happen? That was a good one. 
Um, you, you, I think you can guess what Jimmy's bottom line was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that it did. Uh, then we did one on, this was a really cool one, the San Diego Border Patrol ghost story. And this ghost, this story about a, a Border Patrol agent in the San Diego area who died in the mid-90s and who appeared to border crossers. I really want to listen to that one. It, it's a good one. It's a good one. So we, those, we recorded those two uh, on Saturday, and those were, those, that was really good. Uh, so we got a couple other ones coming up in, um, in July, too. Uh, Paula, Paula Deacon's weird, The Weird World of Paula Deacon. It's really, that one's really wild, too. It, that's a two-parter. Anyway, so that's what I did on Saturday. Um, anything else? I you feel did some, like you did some awesome cleaning. Yeah, I I finally tackled my bedroom and did a lot of uh reorganizing, cleaning, vacuuming. It's still it's still got a ways to go, but it's a lot better. It's yeah. How do you how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. <laughs> yeah, well I have a bad history, though, of, like, tackling the worst problem area, getting it looking good enough, and then, like, going on to something else and never getting the rest of the problem areas. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I am not a great housekeeper. You have many talents. And, uh... I know what... Housekeeping is not one of them. <laughs> it's something we... It's, it's, that is the life we live. That's fine. I, I frankly, I don't think... I, yeah. Anyway, I don't want to get into it. <laughs> It's not the most important talent, but, you know, we'll, go, we'll move from there. But we live in a small house, seven people. It, it's going to be a problem regardless. Uh, all right, let's move on to food, because we got a lot to talk about here. You were very busy cooking this week. I was. I, so the, I finally started do a couple things helped with this, okay? So I've got, I did four new recipes this week. And the, way I, the reason I did this was in, in the Paprika app. So this is the app, our cookbook app that we use. And it has a function called for meal planning. And so I just started saying, I'm going to do this meal on this date. And I'm going to do this one on this date. And I'm not being, you know, super strict about it. Because if we get that day and it's raining on them, well, obviously I'm not going to grill that thing. So I'll just move it to another day. But it's the act of putting it on the calendar and making sure I have the ingredients to make these things. That makes me more likely to do it. Meal planning. It works. <laughs> Who would have thunk? <laughs> when you do it, it works. Right. Instead of it's 4.30 going, well, what do you want to make for dinner? Yeah. I don't know. What do we got? I'm, I'm definitely liking this trend of you, like, doing more cooking. Well, and again, this is both of us together. Right. Well, you're usually making, like, the, the main dish, and then I will go ahead and make, like, veggie sides and yes. stuff. Yes, and then I'll do the salad, and you, you right. We, we, it's a cooperative effort. It's, it's not like I'm sitting around doing nothing. Right. <laughs> exactly. All right, so let's talk about the things we made, and then we could uh, we'll go through them fairly quick. We'll see. Right. So the first one is uh, beef suya. Now, if you remember from a few weeks ago, we made this pork dish, which was pork suya, uh, which was um, based on that doesn't work. Um, there we go. So it's a Nigerian dish. Suya is a Nigerian dish. Right. It's a Nigerian street food, and now the the pork one we made a few weeks ago was an adaptation of the street food, which is a beef, a beef skewer. This one, the beef suya that I made, is mo closer to the actual street food dish. And this one, I, uh, the, on the other one, we adapted because we know peanuts, so we used pistachios, and that worked out pretty good. We liked that. Yeah. So this one, I had the, the peanuts, and I, I dialed back a bit on the heat because it's <laughs> Nigerian street food. It's going to be spicy. I dialed back a little bit on the heat. I could probably dial back a little more even. I like the heat, but for the heat, we have a couple of kids who are very heat sensitive, yeah. spice, spicy heat sensitive. So, yeah. Uh, but what'd you think? I liked it. I liked it a lot. Uh, so because you were making a Nigerian food, I decided to try my hand at a Nigerian side dish. Uh, which is not traditionally, I don't think they're traditionally eaten together. Because it's a street food. The beef suya is a street right. food. Right. Um, but I made jollof rice, uh, which is a traditional dish. We've, we've read. We've tried it before. We've tried it before, but the recipe. It, that was, one didn't come out as some, well. Something didn't, didn't work right. Right. Anyway, um, but since, since the first time you tried it, we read the Anna, Anna Hibiscus, Hibiscus series. Yeah. And jollof rice is one of Anna's favorite foods. And so that sort of made it more interesting to the kids. Like, ooh, we're going to eat Anna's food. <laughs> you know you gotta right. cook yes um and so i found a recipe and i made it and 
It came out really good. I, I again, dialed back on the heat a lot because I wanted the kids to actually try it and <laughs> yeah. enjoy it. I might actually make it a little bit hotter next time. Throw a little back in. Yeah. Um, but so basically you puree tomatoes, peppers, and onions into like a nice a slurry. Sofrito almost. Yeah. And then you, you cook that and then you, you add the rice to that and you cook the rice in that. I, I also threw in some bouillon because Give one of the recipes flavor. one of the recipes I was looking at in somebody in the comments said that they did that and yeah that worked really nicely. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a yeah. really good meal. Yeah. I, I liked that. The thing about the the suya that I really liked is that it you make this um dry rub almost of the with the peanuts and the spices, sweet paprika, ground ginger, garlic powder, onion powder, brown sugar, cayenne pepper and black pepper. And then you mix it um uh, you mix some of it up with uh, oil and then you marinate the meat in it and then you skewer it. And then while it's cooking, you, you baste it with that oily mixture, but near the end, you sprinkle it with the dry peanut stuff at the end. And so you get a, a combination of textures in the, in the flavoring. And it was really, I really liked it. It was really good. So that was the beef suya. Then we had a, uh, we we went to Asia for a different dish. This was a grilled chicken with a soy sauce tear. Now, the tear is a is a kind of a, a Japanese sauce, and here's here's what's in it: mirin, sake. Mirin is a sweetened sake, basically sweetened rice wine. Rice wine. Sorry, my mouth is moving fast in my brain. Uh, sake. I substituted sherry because we don't have sake. Ginger, garlic shiitake mushrooms, brown sugar, and soy sauce. Now, what does that sound like to you? I said, so basically you're making teriyaki sauce. It, and yeah, it, it is the same essential ingredients, except for the shiitake mushrooms. It's the same essential ingredients that are in a, in a teriyaki sauce. But it was a lot lighter than a typical teriyaki, wasn't it? It, it was a lot lighter. It didn't, it didn't feel as... It wasn't as sweet and cloying. Yeah, and... It, not as thick either. It was yeah, a little thinner. It was very. It was much thinner. Yeah, it, even when I'm putting it on it while it's cooking, and the flavor was w- when you're eating it is I I don't know I I kind of like it better than teriyaki. Yeah, and teriyaki kind of just forms a glaze, and it's a very strong flavor. This and they must be related because soy sauce tear teriyaki uh, is it sounds a lot i mean i don't know japanese and maybe they're not maybe they're not at all maybe maybe they're just homophones (laughs) yeah but 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 the way it works is uh you have the bone-in skin on chicken thighs which you um you have to slash it to the bone like you slash really good so that when you're basting it while it cooks with the tear Uh it's really getting into the meat so that was a really good right. thing. And the whole thing cooks on the... So you set up a two-level fire in your grill, and you put all the coals on one side. This is usually how I cook meat on the grill. And then there's a hot side and a cold side, and it cooks entirely on the, on the cooler side, indirect heat, because the one thing that we've discovered when you're cooking chicken parts over the, on a fire is that they get very... The, it, when the fat renders from the skin it makes really awful gross smoke that makes it taste kind of weird, kind yeah. of smoky. I, I, yeah. So, I, but this one avoided all of that by not being over the, the hot coals. And yeah, it worked really well. I really like that. And, and you served it with lemon slices too? Yep. Which I really liked the combination, I think, too. I really like that combination of soy and lemon. Yes. That just really hits the spot for me. And so... uh. And we and we served it with salad, and there was lots of veggies and stuff on the plate. Um, and I really liked that. I think I actually threw the chicken onto my salad, if I recall. Yeah, for the kids, we made pork. Uh, we made rice bowls, so we made the, the the rice bowl rice with the soy and the sesame, and they cut up the chicken and put it on top of their rice bowl. Right. So that's how how we did it for them. And then you and I just did regular salad salad and rice and i had some rice and that sort of stuff so that one worked out pretty well so the soy sauce tear definitely uh, make that again that was a good one um and then saturday night went in a whole different direction i made a blt salad so this is a, so bacon lettuce and tomato the, this one is an interesting one and i i, I saw it i, mm, I could have grilled but i decided to do this it's an indoor dish and so it's you cook up bacon 
you you uh, t- then you take some ciabatta bread that you've cubed up, and you basically make croutons of it by cooking it in the bacon fat that's been rendered from cooking the bacon, and then you just add you know cut up tomatoes, uh, romaine lettuce, and then you make a, a vinaigrette of mayonnaise, red wine vinegar, Dijon mustard, a garlic and a garlic clove. And then you're supposed to toss it all together with the romaine and the fresh basil and the tomatoes and all in one big bowl. You don't like dressing a uh, pre-dressed salad. Generally not. And so I kind of made it deconstructed. And it says eight slices of bacon. And I'm looking at it going, yeah, that's not going to fly. <laughs> so I That made would be one slice of bacon per person. That's uh, One extra for me. Right. So I made two pounds of bacon, <laughs> which is basically four times, I think, the amount of bacon. Well, not per person, though. No, no, no. I'm like, it's, it was eight, I made two pounds of bacon, which is four, there's about 16 slices of bacon in each pack, packet. Right. No, no, no. But, but, it, but per person, like how many was the salad, the original recipe served, supposed to serve? Four. Four. So each person would have got, the original would have served two slices per person. Okay. So you doubled it. So I, I, I doubled, well, no, I quadrupled the amount of bacon. Well, you quadrupled the amount of bacon, but, but not per person. I don't understand what you're saying. <laughs> it, because because we had double the amount of people. So so I did, didn't I just totally double. ignored I ignored the, right. the the thing. I I also did instead of 4 ounces of ciabatta, I did a whole loaf which was about 8 ounces. So I doubled the amount of you, you doubled croutons. you doubled the recipe but then you double doubled the bacon. Sure. Why not? So that's uh, well, what I'm saying. I didn't have enough tomatoes, so I didn't even I didn't I didn't even reach the uh, number of tomatoes for the four. I just kind of winged it. <laughs> <laughs> right. We so, yeah, we were we, we were, were sh- woefully short of tomatoes this week. Yeah. But what did you think? I mean, bacon. Oh, I mean, I love salad with bacon and mm-hmm. I mean, the, the dressing was pretty good. Yeah. I liked it. it. It didn't feel like that much of a novelty to me cuz I used to do yeah, salad was, bacon on salad all the time. Right. But they sell bacon bits in the jar. So no. No, no, they used to sell bacon bits. In fact, they no, probably no, but that's it. not what I would... Oh, I know, I know. But I'm saying bacon on salad is a thing. Right. Yeah. So uh, I'm not sure why this is that big a deal. Right. I mean, it was good. Yeah. I, I, would, I would eat that all the time. It would be good as something like you bring to a party. Yeah, sure. You know, I mean, if you, if you made it a bit bigger and you had all the extra bacon and you, and you mixed it all up ahead of time, if you needed to bring something to a party, that would be something good to to bring to a party. Yeah, that would be a, a nice summer party kind of dish. Yeah. I'd say that. Yeah. And, you know, bacon. <laughs> but, but then you'd have to share your bacon with all the people at the party. That's the only flaw in that. That That is a flaw, is you would have to share the bacon <laughs> with everyone. I'm I'm generally kind of have difficulty with sharing when it comes to bacon. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Well, we're, we're, this is a family thing, so... <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so that, that worked out okay. And then the, the dish we had tonight, I was going to make a Moroccan chicken skewer dish, which required more lemons than we ended up having on Sunday night. We used a lot of lemons. Well, you made lemon muffins this week. I, I made lemon muffins, and then there was something else that used lemon. Oh, fish. And then you made fish cakes from leftover fish today. Yeah. And that also used lemon. So we, yeah, so which is fine. So I pivoted. And I found this Peruvian grilled chicken skewers recipe. Um, and it was pretty good. So it, it starts with uh, the boneless skinless chicken thighs. And you cut them up into, it says one inch cubes, but thighs aren't really cubes. So, but one inch pieces. And then you make a marinade of garlic, cumin, chili powder. I skipped the red pepper flakes. I kind of wish they were in there. You should have put the red pepper flakes in. I, um, next time I put them in. Smoked paprika, brown sugar olive oil, soy sauce, lime juice, and ginger. Okay. And then you take half of it and you put it in a in the Ziploc bag with the chicken and you massage it all in and you let it sit and marinate. And then you skewer it, grill it, and then when it's while it's grilling, you you basically basting it with the rest of the marinade. And um what'd you think? It was tasty. I, I really like it. I like skewers with the chicken thighs. I feel like they don't dry out as much as the breast. I I am completely indifferent on the subject <laughs> of chicken thighs versus breasts. I think that they taste equally good. I, well, I think they taste equally good. I, but I think it, I, I, and I think that breasts are easier to 
They're easier to cube and easier secure cube. it and all that sort of stuff. There was, I mean, yeah. I don't I don't feel like the I don't I know the whole People say the thighs don't dry out and the breasts do, but I honestly I think a marinated piece of chicken is a marinated piece of chicken. Uh I think well modestly, I'm a pretty good at grilling, and so I know how to cook the chicken breast skewers so that they don't dry out. But I will acknowledge that you can cook uh, thighs to a higher temp before they dry, get dried out than you can with chicken, the uh, breast. Okay. So, but okay. From my perspective, eating it, I, I really didn't even realize they were thighs and not breasts. Okay. Well, it's same they're same. cheaper than the thin breasts, so... <laughs> well, as long as you're doing the cutting up of the chicken, I don't mind, because I do not like messing around with cutting up thighs. It's just well, annoying. these were pre-boned. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't bone them and skin them myself. But, but even so, like, the, they're, they're more annoying size pieces. Yeah, like, they are. They are. They are no, weird, they're more annoying. Weird yeah. chunky sizes. I yeah, well, I'm doing all the, uh, the skewering. The sk- I do a lot. I'm do- we're doing a lot of skewers. Right. And I've been doing a lot of skewering of my finger. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. So I, I did side vegetables of green beans and snap peas and carrots and turnips. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, I think I think I nailed the carrots and turnips this time. Oh, they were really good. Uh, so I cooked the carrots until they were soft. And then I added the turnip chunks and cooked it until the turnips were soft. Because they shouldn't be the same texture at the end. No. The, the carrots actually were, were almost overcooked. Like they were starting to kind of turn into mush and becoming a gravy on the turnips. Uh-huh. Um, but I also used a lot of art chicken drippings and some butter so it was like really good lots of good fat yeah i mean at that point just throw in some bacon fat and we'll be done with it right. uh and then i cooked the the sugar snap peas in the the leftover dregs of the chicken and butter fat i just added a bit more oil and water mm. and uh yeah it was a good that, dinner yeah it was good yeah uh, we serve rice with it i think we should serve potato with it yeah Potatoes would have involved turning on the oven, uh, which I know, I know. Uh, but if if I were to, if I were to say which one was it would have been a better match for the uh, for the dish, I think the potatoes would have been. Would you have done it with like fry? Could could you have done it with fries? You think? I suppose. I suppose. Yeah. So I look at it and go, you know, what about an air fryer for potatoes? Does an air fryer heat up the kitchen as much as the oven would? I have no idea. Yeah. I, I've, I've been so completely indifferent to air fryers. I know they're the big thing. I have been, too. But now, like, I, people I trust who are not, like, taken in by the latest gadget, like I am, <laughs> saying, no, this is actually a valid alternative that is a, that's better than turning on your oven. So, what, what, I mean, I, I it's honestly... It's basically a convection. It's a, it's a small convection oven. Okay. But you, like, it's supposed to be, like, low fat because you're not frying things in oil? Is you're not deep the... frying things, you, and you use less oil. There's still oil. You're but, still but coating you, it and you, stuff. But you can still, like, coat it in oil and stuff. So it's yeah. like doing it in the oven, just... Yes. It's like doing it in the oven, but you're not heating, turning on the oven. Okay, because I honestly had no idea what the heck the yeah. air fryer But it's like, it's a small convection, so it's a fan that's blowing it around. So I think that's... That's where the air comes from? Like that's the, the air, air part of it. The yes. air part of air fryer. Right. I think the whole name air fryer is a marketing gimmick in order to, con- to convince people, like, why should I buy this thing? It's not because it's a small conve- uh, countertop convection oven, which nobody would... Everyone would go, duh, I don't know what you're talking about, and, and skip it. But, oh, it's a health device. It makes healthier food because it fries it, but air fries. And we know everybody loves fried food. So if we can make fried food healthy, everyone will want one. And that's, and that's why it felt like a gimmick for the longest time. Because it's like, like pull me out of the leg now. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. But people, again, people I respect uh, who, you know, whose opinion I respect is like America's Test Kitchen. They're talking about it. Like, no, this has actually turned out to be a valid thing. Sort of like the Instant Pot. It's not just a gimmick. Oh, I will take that under advisement. <laughs> it was t- every t- we don't, again, we have very little space. So anytime we yeah. add something, we have to make sure it's it's worthwhile the space it will take up and what's it going to replace. So, um, all right. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. That's the food for this week. Let's move on to what we've been reading and watching. Um, let's start with what you read. Uh, uh, the, you finished the Ibis trilogy. I finished finally. Yay! The Ibis. It was really good. 
uh two thumbs up uh so better than because i remember your initial thought on the first volume of the trilogy you were a little iffy on it yeah i i, I thought it wrapped up really nicely uh bringing the characters kind of back together again uh we finished this is the historical novel that the uh, trilogy that c- c- covers the the first opium war the first opium war now from a from basically an indian perspective yeah the the author is indian he's he splits his time between india and new york uh, i think he says calcutta and goa and new york um and so yeah most of the char- most of the point of view characters are indian there's there's a Chinese character, there's some a French character and an American character and some British characters, but um but there's a there's a really heavy leaning towards the Indian point of view, which I really liked. Um and I, there's a really interesting emphasis on sort of language and um it sort of wrapped up with this with this nice little footnote epilogue about how the one character uh, had collected all of this, these books and documents about the Opium War. Mm-hmm. And it was interesting because it was essentially the author's, like, further reading list. Oh, interesting. Except it was sort of within the, the scope of the narrative. Instead of doing the work, a work cited or a further reading or bibliography, he was like, these are all of the documents that he collect. This character collected in his library that I've been and I've run out of time to tell more of his story. It's taken me three volumes to just get through, you know, to this point. And it, like like all good frame narratives, you're left wondering, okay, was there really a historical parallel to this character, or did he just make him up whole cloth? Like, was there an archive of documents that he actually consulted, or is this just his literary device? I really like that kind of frame narrative, that, which leaves me wondering, like, mm-hmm. what's real, what's not? And I almost don't want to find out. Like, I, I like the kind of uncertainty. Sure. Anyway, it was, it was good. Okay. Uh, we're going to talk about the other book I read right. in a little bit. Yeah. Because <laughs> you read it too. Yes, we'll get to that. Uh, I just wanted to talk about some other things I watched this week. Uh, so I watched the first episode of a new Netflix series that everyone's talking about called Shadow and Bone. It's based on yet another young adult <laughs> series of novels. This isn't everything. Uh, it it's a It's a complex young adult story. It has some of the usual YA tropes with like the the you have the young female character who isn't uh who doesn't realize her importance she thinks she's just another unimportant person in the world and everyone kind of looks down on her and talks down to her but she's got a hidden talent that's just waiting to emerge and she has that one friend who is always encu- has always encouraged her and she has this emergence and now she becomes the most important person in the world <laughs> To save everyone, Harry Potter, <laughs> Hunger Games. Oh, what was the other one? The uh, the one they made boobies of. I forget what it was. But yeah, it's it's that same sort of thing. Okay, that said, it's 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 the trope. It's a it's the YA trope, and and it's a little annoying that everybody important in the in the story is is basically a, you know under the age of twenty five. Like like there there's like very few people over the age of twenty five who are at all important or powerful. <laughs> <laughs> apparently uh, uh however it's an interesting complex story there's an in- it's an interesting unique pre- uh, uh premise um it there's a lot of ab- about the politics of the place it's a fictional world but it looks the countries are very either russian or chinese like they're based on russia and china it's a little bit like a guy Cavriel k does where this is clearly russia but it but it's not called russia right <laughs> That sort of thing. So, um, and there's a there's very much a 19th century aesthetic, so kind of steampunkish, with magic. So it's a world with magic in it. Okay. And it reminds me a bit of the Amazon Prime series called Carnival Row, which is is a similar right, aesthetic. Which you saw. Which I saw. Um, and the pr- the basic premise is that there's th- th- this one country that's the the focus of this was split in half by this event. This weird zone that is filled with 
these creatures that live in the dark, in the shadows. And anybody who tries to cross it um, is risking their lives. Most people who cross it are eaten up by these creatures. Okay. And But this country's cut in half, and they can't go around it. So they have to try to get through it. And then by the end of the first episode, you get this site. They, they tell you within the first 15 minutes of the episode that we're looking for the, 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 the person with this absolutely rare magical talent that is, hasn't been seen in hundreds of years. And uh, one that brings light into the darkness and that they're the one person who could possibly bring down the fold or something. Whatever. I think I forget what they exactly call it. I think it's called the fold. And you're like, oh, yeah, so she's got to have it. <laughs> like it's, it's pretty clear from the beginning that she's going to be the one. Um, that said, I'm, I'm going to watch more of it. I'm, I'm kind of curious to see where it goes um, and whether it's interesting. Sounds like there might be a little bit of a uh, East Germany, West Germany analog going on. There country, might be. Country split in half, people needing to get from one side to the other. Well, yes and no. I mean, it's a unified country, and they're at war with the China country. So there's a, there's a, there's a it feels a bit more like the 19th century age of great nations mm-hmm. sort of stuff going on. Actually, some maybe it's a little bit of the opium war in there as well, so. Uh, so it was all right. So Shadow and Bone, I'm, I'll I'll watch a little more, see how that is. The other thing I watched is the new Pixar movie called Luca. Um, I haven't heard anything about that. Standard Pixar formula. Uh, there's the conflict with the parents who need to learn from the child how to give up on the things that scare them and hold them back and be more open to the world. However, uh, it goes beyond that. So the, the premise is it takes place in the Ligurian coast of Italy probably around okay. in the mid mid 20th century so about the 1950s and the in the Cinque Terre region the five towns and there's these sea monsters that live off the coast in their sort of insular parochial world with i mean ironically and one of the the young sea monster named Luca um ends up going onto the land when they go into the land, they change form from the sea monster shape to the human shape. They they automatically transform. Okay, so kind of so like... So they look human. Like like mermaids or sulkies. Right. Right, exactly. Like, think of um, Splash with Daryl Hannah, which is a very old movie. Uh, it, I, and li- I, I and was, like in that... I was thinking more like Secret of Rowan Inish. Yes. Or a Little Mermaid, but, but okay, sure. No, but the, thing, the reason I mentioned Splash is that if they get wet, they they turn back. They begin to re- uh, revert. Okay. So there's this constant gimmick of them having to avoid getting wet and getting wet and trying to hide until they can dry off. Okay. So I, I can see the the potential for comic antic. Yes. Right. The milieu right. is awesome. I love the Italian villages, the mid 20th century Italian village, uh-huh. the fishing village. Right. It, that, that speaks to me. I, I can understand that. <laughs> uh, there's a, there's a, a, a three-sided relationship, a friendship among, so Luca, his friend Angelo, El, Angelo, Alberto, Angel, I think it's, I know it's one of those, I forget what it is, and who's another sea monster, but who is more outgoing on his own, his, he's basically an abandoned child. And then Julia, who's a, re- a regular human girl who doesn't know it, especially in the beginning, um, that they're sea monsters. And, and her, the, and, they form a friendship and it's just, it, it's actually kind of nice because it's, it has this interesting ideas of three-sided friendship and the dynamics that are in there, which is pretty good. I've heard Stephen Gray Donis calls this very much like a, a studio Ghibli, 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 I think it's Ghibli, studio Ghibli uh-huh. movie. Um, very similar in fact, in many ways. Um, and I, I haven't seen any of those. I haven't either. I and I feel like I should watch one of them like Ponyo or something like that. Um, and Julia's dad is actually a really good character. He's this, at first he just seems like this, like massive grunting one-armed, um, fisherman who hates the sea monsters because one took his arm and he, he so wants to hunt Captain them. Ahab. He, he's an Ahab, but he actually has the time as the, the, the movie, he actually turns out to be a, the rare Pixar movie parent who is actually while he does have to overcome his prejudices and narrow-mindedness a little bit, 
there's more to him, and I kind of like that. So, um, it's it. There's a lot of the Pixar formula, but I kind of liked it. It was a cute movie, and it's free on on Disney Plus. So you don't have to pay extra for it, so you might as well. If you got Disney Plus, you might as well watch it. It's worth it's worth right. watching, and the kids would like it. I think there's a lot of funny in the the in the the slapstick, and then there's the the obnoxious uh, Italian kid who's the bully that they have to, who gets his comeuppance and all, all that sort of stuff. So there's a lot of that in there. And then, of course, we watched the second episode of Loki. Right. That continuing to be intriguing and leaving me with more questions than mm-hmm. answers. Uh, my commentary on this episode was something finally clicked, which had been kind of niggling at the back of my mind in the first episode, which is, wow, this has really got an Umbrella Academy sort of vibe to it. That's the Netflix series that was two seasons so far, right? Right. Based on also based on comic books like Loki is. Uh, but in both you have both both series, you have a time travel agency, which is sort of capricious and arbitrary and not necessarily just right. Uh, who are trying to control the timeline. And then you have um, and, they, and their aesthetic is mid 20th century. Yeah. Like this weird. We're from the future, except we're also from the mid-20th century for some reason. It's kind of quirky. I kind of like it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just was thought, that's what Loki's been making me think of. Like, it was sort of in the back of my mind until it finally <laughs> right. clicked. And I, okay. So if you've been watching Umbrella Academy, that's, that is very much a, a, yeah, an Umbrella Academy vibe in this one. Um, yeah, I feel like, I don't want to rev- spoil anything, but I feel like there's... As usual with Marvel movies, there's a subtext, there's a sub-level that the comic book fans are getting that the rest of us aren't. Oh, I'm, I'm sure. But if, especially in this one, I think with the, with the resolution of this one, uh, the character that comes in at the end, right. that the fans know... I've, I've been trying to follow, you know, look up online. Fans of the Marvel comics know more about this than others, so... But, you know, that that doesn't usually spoil my appreciation of things like no. I, I don't really mind. In fact, Marvel does a pretty good job of making their stuff accessible to both the fan, the deep fan and the casual fan. In fact, I think that maybe part of the success is the depth of the source material, because what I find is that often adaptations which are drawing from and condensing a really broad and deep source material tend to have a feeling of richness, like of untapped depths of of unexplained mysteries. And I really mm-hmm. tend to like that. I don't necessarily want the worlds, the fan- fantasy worlds I visit to have everything explained. I like to have that feeling of further horizons. And it's one of the things like Tolkien does well in Lord of the Rings is the ceil- feeling that the world is much bigger than the story, and this is only one possible story you have the taking feeling, place in the world. Yeah, if you were to go down the road a piece and turn the corner, there'd be a whole there'd be that would be defined. It would be right. wouldn't be just the false front of an of a right. set. And the characters have their own lives and existences before and after the story itself. Like there's there's more there there, mm-hmm. and some some. Some works of art, works of fiction can carry that off well. And sometimes you feel like it's all just window dressing and there's nothing really behind the cardboard cutouts. Right. Right. Um, so. Yeah. But it still continues to be an interesting show. Yeah. I'm, I'm waiting for the, the floor to be pulled out from under me. Rug. Rug. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, knew I, I was could pull the floor out from under you, too. But the rug is usually not. I was I was waiting. For, I'm, I'm waiting for the rug to be pulled out from under me as yes. it was in WandaVision, because I just yeah. have a feeling something's coming. Oh, yes. I'm sure there yeah. is. Anyway. So, uh, yeah. All right. So let's address the uh, the the book that you and I both finished reading, The Hail Mary Project by Andy Ware. Andy Ware is the author of The Martian, which, which was, was also another which, good book. Right. Fine novel. And his second book was called Artemis, which, which was you, not as good. You read and I didn't because yeah. you didn't give it a rave review. So I just yeah. decided to skip it. Um, it was OK. It just was not the same. And then Hail Mary Project is, we, I think we both agree, a return to form. In fact, I think that this is actually better than The Martian. OK. I, so, I, I actually think I liked it better. We're going to talk about it, it at first in some spoiler free terms and then we'll 
uh, ring the buzzer horn or the buzzer bell, whatever the spoiler bell, uh, you know, metaphorically, and then uh, you can skip ahead. What, what what I'll do is I'll put some chapter markers in the in the show file so that in your podcast player, when you see that come up, you can skip past our spoilish discussion to afterward, uh, so that you don't have to be spoiled by by this if you haven't read it yet or in in you're interested. But okay, in general terms, it. The the Hail Mary project is a project that comes about when um, Earth suffers a major catastrophe from from something from outer space. Something is dimming the sun's light. Okay, that's still really spoilery to me. Um, well, I mean, you've learned that like fairly early. Yeah. So so the novel opens with main character, point of view, first person narrator. Waking up and not knowing who where he, he is. is, not yeah. knowing where he is, but also not knowing who he is. That's true. And I love that kind of story. I love being just dropped into a narrative, having no idea what's going on and having the narrator be as clueless as I am. And then so he discovers and explores the world. And that's your sort of entree into the world. And he starts to get memories back. Right. One of the things I really liked about this book is the the multi-layered flashback approach kind of like the lost approach right. where as he recovers memories first one by one very painfully and slowly and then it kind of snowballs and later on he he gets more and more but you get the feeling that it's not until really late in the in the novel that he really re- remembers everything about his past yes. life uh, there is a moment at which i think that you you feel like he's kind of achieved the goal of the memories, and we don't really get that much more flashback after that. Right. Um, In fact, I don't think we get any. Right. Um, but I really like the un, the way the story unfolds, that sort of dual. He's moving forward in time, trying to figure out, and it's a very classic, like, black box sort of thing. I'm I'm in a box. I have to figure out where I am. What can I do? tell about the world around right. me and because it's andy weir the the character is a scientist and he uses science he to uses figure science, out where he is but he's it's also awesome. clever and glib and funny yes and there's a lot less swearing than in the martian in yes. fact there's really no swearing I'm trying to think yeah there's one or two moments i think which were not kid friendly but kid friendly swears but not yeah. non-kid friendly swears not kid friendly swears yeah everything else um, is pretty kid friendly he's yeah he he um he's not a person who swears as much as the uh narrator of the martian does oh there is actually there is a relationship at one point that is also not kid friendly right but um yeah so is there anything else we can say without spoiling it um it's really a novel in two parts you know what i mean there's two this it gets it it's so it's fine up to one point, and then from that point on, it takes on a whole different cast. That is what really makes it great. I yeah, I suppose. I mean, I didn't feel like it it shifted for me as much as it, it did for you. Uh, for, like I was okay. kind of all on board from the get go. Okay. Um, but yeah, it it has it has it's like an onion. It has layers of revelation, and I liked that. Like it constantly felt like it was. Well, one thing we could say is that one of the things we like about the both the Martian and this book is that Andy Weir doesn't pull back on putting his characters in peril, like putting them in real peril. You feel like he's really putting them in yes. bad situations that he doesn't even maybe know how they're going to get it out of it. Also, I feel like the the peril the the, the the problem comes first and then the solution. Whereas yes. I feel like a lot of authors, cough, cough, JK Rowling, um, <laughs> create the peril because they've created a plot outline and they need insert danger here. Yes. And it feels like the danger, the obstacle, whatever is there because the plot requires there to be an obstacle. Whereas I feel like Andy Weir says, what would happen if this broke? And that's the obstacle. And then the story unfolds because the character, the person, has to feel their way through that obstacle and creatively solve the problem. But it's a real obstacle, like it's a real narrative obstacle for the author. And it's in solving that obstacle 
through the point of view of the character, the, the character unfolds, their personality unfolds, but also the story unfolds. Like, it's very organic, and it doesn't feel yeah. like the obstacles are forced onto the narrative. Rather, the obstacles are the narrative in a way. And when the uh, when these problems happen, you're like, oh, my gosh. How is, like, oh, like, <laughs> like, as a reader, I'm like, oh, no, no. Why no? Well, and in fact, I actually felt like Hail Mary Project navigated that slightly better than the martian i felt like the martian at some point kind of felt like the author was tormenting the character in that like how many more horrible catastrophes can he throw at what is the the name of the narrator i cannot remember oh uh, start with a w um n- now i have to look it up Hold I, on. I keep wanting to say matt damon because now the, <laughs> I've, I've seen the movie more recently than i've read the book and it's, yes um um yeah, but in in any case, in any case, I'll look it up while you while you're doing. Uh, it. And I felt like this character, like the the situation, just it felt like I don't know. It Watney. felt Mark Watney. Watney, that's right. right. Um, I felt like the 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 narrator of um, Hail Mary, Mary Project. Project yeah. His his difficulties aren't any less than Watney's, but I felt like they were a little bit more organic to the situation in which he was, had been dropped. Right. If that makes sense. Yeah. It didn't feel like a little as quite as much. How many different things can we problems can we solve? And it felt more like the initial scenario naturally bred all of the complications Whereas in The Martian, I felt like some of the complications were kind of piled on just to to make it complicated, to make it complicated, if that makes sense. Sure, sure. I think Andy Weir has progressed in his writing skill, and I think that that it shows. And, the, and maybe this was a slightly better mm-hmm. uh, scenario than The Martian. So the other thing about the that I really liked is that the flashbacks progress in such a way as you know that the flashbacks have to get to the point where the character wakes up and you don't know how he gets there. Like you have to wait for the flashbacks to reveal how did the character get to this point? Right. Like, like he keeps you in suspense as to how he got to where he is. It's not at all clear for a lot of the book. I mean, it's, it's like until the last third, fourth yeah. of the book that you do, you, you start actually to get figure a, you, out. You start to get a hint. You start to figure it out, but, but, but you don't know the actual mechanism, right. the actual, like, what happens turning to, point that gets him there that's yeah. in fact that's that's the end of the flashbacks is the right. turning point how did he get to here right which was really nice and narratively it was very satisfying yes um like the amnesia is a device can be overused and sometimes it can just be it feel really forced i really liked the way andy weir works the amnesia into the plot i don't want to give away too much but it it works really well in this scenario it's part of the scenario it's not a stupid add-on okay all right at this point i want to go to the spoiler discussion because we got to move move things along here right so uh we're gonna i'm gonna spoil alert here in about 10 minutes we'll come back from it but i'm gonna put chapter markers in from the 53 minute point about well it won't be 53 minutes for you but once i've edited it but it'll about 53 minutes to the and then you'll see the next chapter marker will be the end of this discussion if you haven't yet read the book. All right. So let's start our discussion then, which is um, the, one of the great parts. Of, so it's called the Hail, Hail Mary Project, and the character's name is Grace. He's the, he's the, the single astronaut left inside the spaceship. He, he is, it is the Hail Mary full of grace. Right. <laughs> which is a great pun. Right. I mean, the, the, the religious symbolism kind of stops and ends at the names. And yet I feel like thematically, while religion is not mentioned and it's really there's nothing overtly religious. In fact, it's 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 in many ways, it's overtly secular. It's, right. It's materialist. Um, and yet thematically, there is a theme of grace. And as I was reading, this is kind of jumping ahead. But as I was reading Mother Sophia's reflection on Jonah, I started to realize that. Which was uh, had to do with this Sunday's gospel on the storm in the sea, the storm in the sea. I started to realize that Ryland Grace is kind of a Jonah figure. He's the reluctant 
hero who has been sent on a mission that he against his will strong armed into a mission very much against his will that he does not want to be on at all and yet he responds eventually with grace and he has this beautiful beautiful redemption arc i loved the redemption in this novel was was fabulous i love one of the things i love about this was how the the point that I was talking about where the, the novel turns for me is when he meets Rocky, when he meets the alien oh my gosh, in the Tau yes. City system. And I love the fact that, that Rocky as an as a sci-fi alien is completely breaks the tropes because he's he looks like a spider. And at one point he points out in a, in a you know, Grace says to him sort of they're kind of bickering a little bit like, you know, there's a gr- there's a gross, terrible creature, deadly creature on Earth called a spider that you look just like. <laughs> like he kind of makes a point of it. But Rocky never comes across as a dangerous creature, a potentially violent enemy. Other, other than the, uh, the, apart very from the very first, beginning, the very yeah. first moment of like when he sees him for the first time and has this sort of instantaneous visceral, visceral recoil. Yeah. But then he gets past it, and I, I love there's there's this moment where when he when he starts to like scientifically analyze Rocky and sort of say, okay, now what am I actually looking at here as a scientist, as opposed to as like his initial ooh, ick spider caveman, <laughs> uh, right? Um, the first, the first uh, comparison he makes is, oh, he's about the size of a Labrador. And eventually, immediately Rocky becomes a cute little puppy. Right. He becomes right? like a, he, like a dog. a dog. Yeah. And he kind of maintains that sort of, doggish character even though he's nothing like a dog at all well but in my mind i think he kind of had that feeling of warm friendly fuzziness even though there's nothing warm fuzzy partly, about him partly because his, the diction of the dialogue is sort of um stilted in such a way as to make him chi- almost childlike right um yeah he he has i mean because their their vocabulary is limited he feels kind of childish and yet He's clearly not childlike. He's very, right. very smart. In fact, he's oftentimes seems much smarter than Grace. Yeah, it, in many ways. Grace names him Rocky because his carapace the is is made of rock. The the people Rocky's people are from the Arid, the star system Eridani forty, I think it was. But anyway, and so he names them Eridanians, and he gives them the name Rocky, and so the, at one point he says, "Hey Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat." Which is you know, Rocky Bullwinkle, and Rocky doesn't get it. Right. I, oh. And when he finds out that Rocky has a mate, he he um, he asks Rocky what's his mate's name, and Rocky gives a Rocky's From language. His language. Yeah. Right, Ro- Rocky's language is not one that uh, Grace can replicate, and so uh, he says, "Well, you're going to have to pick your human equivalent name for my mate," and so he says, "Well." Adrian, right, <laughs> which was great. I mean, yeah, there's a nice little like. Well, obviously, it's going to be Adrian. Adrian. Um. So the you have the whole. I mean, we didn't really even talk about the the reason why they're out there. It was like this this astrophage, this this uh, space born amoeba is basically eating up the sun's energy, and they ha- and Earth is going to be destroyed. So the entire planet gathers together all of its resources to make this one Hail Mary attempt to go to this other solar system that also has the astrophy that is all these other stars are going dim too, but this is the one in the whole area that isn't going dim. So something must be happening there that is stopping it. And so we're making this Hail Mary pass. It's a suicide mission. Literally the astronauts are going to go. They're not going to have enough, you know, energy power, whatever to get back. They're going to send whatever back in these small probe things. And it's going to take, what, what was it, like 17 years round trip? It was like, or, or 20-something years round trip for, the, for, the, for them to go out and then send and the, the message probe, back? the probes. Yeah, I think there was something like yeah. 26 years for or whatever. Earth, but with time dilation, Earth. because they're going so close to the speed of light on their travel, it would be like four years. They would experience four years elapsed out and four years back. So they had to be put in comas to survive because they wouldn't be they didn't think the crew would be able to do it without going crazy and so there's this new long-term coma technology and only one in seven thousand people on earth have the gene that lets them survive okay i i have to say the coma thing was a little bit hokey but what i liked about it 
was that he at least gave a plausible mechanism within the story for why there is such a limited pool of astronauts to go on this mission. Because right. obviously you're going, you've got the, the entire population of Earth to choose from for a mission to save the planet. And yet this guy who is not top anything gets chosen. Right. Why? It's, right. it's not because he's the best of the best. And I think that's what one of the things that makes it the plot work so well is he's not the best of the best. He's a reluctant Jonah who got thrust into this position. <laughs> no pun intended. Um, <laughs> thrust. <get> it. Ah. <laughs> um, and it's all because of a fluke. Right. Well, so much of what happens is because of a fluke. I mean, and, and in, in a sense, as I was reading, it, I'm thinking like it, everything that happens is so improbable that it has to be the act of God. It has to be an act of grace that, that any of this would happen the way it does. Right. And that's really grace is a major theme throughout the novel. Really? The, I mean, the, the novel doesn't call it grace except in his name. And yet clearly there's this movement of grace, this movement of grace throughout where somehow it all works. And even he has that, like you said, that redemption where, he didn't want to go. He he didn't want to go on the suicide mission to save the planet. He was like, "Well, forget the planet. Someone else will have to go." Like from the from there to a point where he's willing to sacrifice his life to save another planet because of this connection and this friendship that he's made with this alien creature. Um, and I love the I love the ending. <laughs> I think it's actually fantastic. I love the. It, it, I wouldn't change it a bit of it. Um, it's fantastic. I and I I really loved the the fact that you have sort of a story within a story within a story it's uh the story of a let's save the earth but then it also becomes a first contact story and then it's also yep. a a buddy novel yes um and i really liked the fact that the genre kept changing a little bit as we moved through the story we went from a we've got to save the earth now we're making first contact with a completely new species, but I can't really spend too much time on that because we have to save the Earth. And where the first contact becomes a secondary thought, a secondary plot line, because we have to get past that in order to save the planet. Right. And I, I think that made it in some ways a much more satisfactory first contact story. Like we moved through that as a phase of the novel rather than making it the whole novel, the, the whole point of the story. Right. Right. And like you said, the learning the languages might've been a little implausibly fast, but I think we needed to get past that in order to get on to the rest of the story. Uh, yeah. It's, it's fast. Um, I mean, they're both supposed to be really, really smart people. So we can kind of like suspend disbelief a little right. bit there. And I like the fact that it's a it's a very alien creature, very alien technology, very alien planet and environment, and the, they're not bumpy headed humans like you see in TV right. sci fi. Uh, alien physiology, alien everything. Like I really but thought, yet, but yet really well thought out. Like Andy Weir thought out the whole shebang from top to bottom. Yeah, you feel yeah. like he, he thought out the details. It was it was a satisfying read. It was one of the most satisfying science fiction novels I read. In It'll quite be a interesting while. to see how they make this into a movie. <laughs> they'll ruin it. <laughs> well, they'll make Rocky into like a dude, like into a. <laughs> no, they'll have to do something. They'll have I, to do something. I mean, they'll make Rocky into like a CGI character, space fighter. Sure, but, but uh, they can't make him scary. They have to make him, like, they have to preserve the personality. Right. Yeah. So. I, I don't know. I don't. I, I don't look forward to seeing the movie because I just think that what I love about the novel will probably okay. go away. As as we promised, ten minutes, and that's been ten okay. minutes. So we got to be careful and not do. If you skipped ahead and been ruined, oh sorry. It's only been another extra forty five seconds, I think, or so. Um, all right. So let's move on. That was so. That's all what we've been reading and watching, and let's move on to talk about. A little bit more, um, because we were a little over time, uh, a little bit more about this week's readings. You kind of previewed a little bit. This week's was about the storm on the sea, where uh, Jesus and the apostles went out into the boat, onto the uh, ocean, and Jesus fell asleep. A storm came up. 
And then they woke Jesus up. Oh, Jesus, yeah. we're dying. And she's and like, have you no faith? Great, right. There was a great stormy sea theme throughout today's readings because we started with Job. Yes. And Job. <laughs> oh, our poor lector said Job. Um, we started with Job and the whole, you know, God was the one who makes the seas. It's got one of my favorite lines. I love the book of Job. And it's got one of my favorite lines where God says to the oceans, Thus far and no further. And yes. Thus far shall you come, but no further. Here shall your proud waves be stilled. And I really, that, that moment of like God setting the limits and stilling the waters, like it's something that is necessary for the seas themselves. And there's this, there's this sort of sense in which the sea stands for us. We are the raging sea. We are raging and God sets the limits for us and says, all right, be still. And so in a way, you see in Job, God calming the waters. Well, in fact, he says, uh, when I made the clouds, it's gar- the, when he says, uh, who shot within doors the sea when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the cloud its garment and thick darkness its swaddling bands. In, in fact, he, the sea is a, ba- a it's screaming a baby. baby, right? It's, right. And when I set limits for it, like a dad does, and fasten, fasten the, bar the bar of its door, door and said, thus far shall you come, but no further, here's the baby gate. <laughs> right. I mean, there's a beautiful imagery in that, Job, of God as this parent dealing with the raging, screaming, bawling child yeah. who doesn't want the limits and Be says, still. and yet the limits are what provide that comfort for a child like children don't want limits or they get mad when they when they hit it against those limits and yet a child who does not have any limits is a very traumatized and unhappy child like children psychologically need those boundaries they they crave them and so god like a loving father gives us the boundaries that we need not necessarily that we want but that we need right and my again, the the psalm for today was one of my. This is one of my favorite psalms. It's a really long one. It's what is it? One hundred seven. One hundred seven. Um, it appears on Saturday Office of Readings, and it's a really really long. The whole psalm is yeah. psalm, and but the the bit about those who sail the sea in ships trading on the deep waters, who see the works of the Lord and His wonders in the abyss, um, and of course God raises up a storm. His command raises up the storm and they mount up to heaven and sink to the depths. And you get this beautiful image of the ship climbing to the peaks of the waves and then sinking to the troughs. But it's compared with the soul kind of rising up to the heights. It's life. Life. Life takes you to the to the heights, to near heaven. And they, it, life brings you to the depths and our hearts melt away in our plight. And we cry to the Lord in our distress. When, when do we cry to God? When we're in the depths. Well, we cry to the Lord when we're when we're going up and when we're going down. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, from there, I like the, the pun. From their straits, he rescued them. Mm. Dire straits, but also like the straits right. of Gibraltar. You know that sort of thing. Uh, and then he hushes the storm to a gentle breeze, and the billows of the sea were stilled, and they rejoiced that they were calmed, and he brought them to their desired haven. And of course, let us give thanks to the Lord for His kindness. I love that psalm. It's mm. beautiful. There's there's a really great parallelism in the psalm where he also taught it also then has the same narrative structure, but for those who are in prison and for those who are in like it right. goes through different kinds of peril, but the same we're in peril and then we cry to the God in our distress and then he saves us. We cry to God, not the God, to God. To God. <laughs> he said the God. Oops. <laughs> God. Uh, okay. And then um, the second reading is from Second Corinthians. Um, and it doesn't talk about the ocean so much, but it it talks about how Christ, he died for us, he died for all, so that those who might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. I, I'm not, Father, I think Father today tried to connect it to the gospel. I'm not, I'm not sure I see clearly, but maybe that's just my own... Mm-hmm. My own limitation. I, mean, I think that there's a there's a whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old things have passed away, and new things have come. Well, there's definitely a baptismal imagery there, and this so I think true. that maybe the, the reading waters, from Saint Paul the, right. reminds us of baptism, which then the waters ties into the whole theme of 
passing through the raging passing waters, passing through the raging waters, and, be, and becoming a new man. Yes. Well, then of course, then there's the gospel from Mark, and okay, one of the things I love about this is the is the detail. Jesus was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. Like Jesus didn't just kind of like fall asleep; he took a nap. Like he got in the boat and said, "You guys do your boat, your right, fisherman right. thing." He wasn't doing the the head bob, yeah, like yeah. falling asleep while you're it's trying like, to pretend like you're staying awake and listening to the homily. Well, you're all taking care of this. I'm gonna go have a nap. Right, <laughs> right. Wake me when we get to the other side. So, I really liked Mother Sophia's take, which was, she says, "When I approached the gospel reading for today, I must confess my first thought was, again." <laughs> um, and she mentions the. Like this is again the storm of the sea. Yeah. The storm of the sea has been, she said, uh, an image which we come back to have come back to over and over again during the pandemic to sort of talk about this is us. This is us in the world. This is us raging and this is the world raging. And is it a cliche, she says? Is it a shallow consolation? Life is stormy. God is sleepy. We want him to prove his power. He does so. Then comes the next storm. Repeat. And then she thinks, the fool falls into the temptation of saying, I already know this text. But the wise man knows it's one thing to know the chemical formula of water and another to savor it by a spring on a summer's day. Yeah, actually, she's quoting from a... Quoting from... Um, a, in a Carmelite in, from Dom no, Bernardo Oliveira. Not Carmelite. Uh, Benedictine. Uh, ben, I'm sorry, Benedictine. Sorry. Um, she says, yes, we know the story, but we're invited to taste it anew. And then she goes off in a completely different direction. For, instead of focusing on Job. Or Jesus. Or Jesus. She talks about Jonah. And Jonah is another of my favorite favorites. Um, and she talks about Jonah sleeping on the ship. Which is very different from Christ sleeping on the ship. Because Jonah's sleep is an attempt to escape the problem and forget about where he is and what he's doing, which is running away from God's will. Um, Jonah is hiding, ensconced in the hold. He closes his eyes and stops his ears. His sleep is a deliberate effort of insensibility. He is resistant to grace. And I really like that that entry into sort of what the storm means for us, this idea of being resistant to God's grace. Um, and that Jonah's greatest act is his self-abandonment where he allows himself to be thrown overboard. Hmm. Um, and again, this, this makes me come uh, back to... Careful, because we're in the non-spoiler section. The... the <laughs> Something I mentioned in the spoilers about uh, Hail Mary Project, but this idea of abandoning oneself to grace is really powerful to me. Um, and she says, I think Jesus loved Jonah, too. He loved him as the perfect image of human nature, wounded and wrongheaded, capable of being turned around, of moments of clarity and goodness, but forever falling back into old patterns. This person, whether resisting, refusing, sleeping, waking, crying out, following, falling, complaining, is continually under the mercy of God. Whether the mercy takes form of a storm at sea or a great big fish or a castor bean plant. This is the sign of Jonah, the human person loved by God, loved enough to be pursued relentlessly, loved enough that God would take on himself this human nature. The Jesus who steps into the boat and falls asleep puts himself into Jonah's shoes and into ours. Hmm. I mean, this is what it is to be human, is to be sort of at the mercy of all of these various storms in life. Right. And yet to always be under God's mercy. Like, God has a plan, even if we're resisting. Our resistance doesn't thwart God's plans. Like, Jonah's resistance doesn't put a spoke in the wheel and stop God's plan. Well, in the, in the gospel, the Jesus is subject to the storm. He is in the midst of that storm. He is his human nature is just as much in the storm as the apostles. But he he knows like look the storm. God is is God of you know the 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 Father is in control of all this. The, I know what my mission is. I'm not worried. Why are you worried? 
you know, they were like, teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? And he's like, he wakes up, rebukes the wind, and says to the sea, quiet, be still. I wonder, though, how much of that is addressed to the apostles as much to the sea and the wind. Well, yeah, to go back to the, the image from Job, the wind and the sea in Job is a really a great a representation of human nature. And so who is he rebuking? Is he rebuking right. the storm out there? Is he rebuking the internal storm? Right. And then when the quiet comes, he says, why are you terrified? Don't you have faith yet? They were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this whom even windows see obey? N now you're getting it. Now you're getting it. Finally, like which dawns. Is, which is really the question that, that Job faces too. Who is God? And God re responds to Jonah, I'm, I mean to Job, you're, I'm bigger than you can imagine. Right. I, I am the God who made all of these great powerful forces that you can't control and, and and to be honest we still do this all of us today we still we still put ourselves up against god you know god why is someone so like why did this person die why is there suffering why is this bad thing happening and he's like why are you terrified don't you have faith why are you scared i got you like i'm not saying that bad things aren't going to happen the bad things will happen we know that People die, people get sick, people lose jobs and homes and all that sort of stuff. That is true. And I'm not saying bad things aren't going to happen in this life, but the big picture, the big picture, God's got a plan. And whatever happens, as long as we have faith, the plan is what matters. What, what happens to us is not ultimately as important because we, have, we live eternally. And as long as we, we die in a state of grace, we get to be with God in eternity in eternal bliss. Why are you terrified? Do, don't you have the faith that you proclaim? I mean, I'm saying this to myself as much as anyone. Don't you have the, the Christian faith in the Holy Spirit indwelling that you've always claimed to have? Don't be terrified. Don't be scared. Like, even if death comes, that's not the end. It's not the whole thing. Who then is this whom, who then is this whom even wind and sea obey? You know, I mean, that's that's how I I, I look at this. And I know pa uh, priests are not going to preach that <laughs> in general because people would people would freak out in the pews if, if the if the pastor got up and said, you know, bad things are going to happen to us all. You, you know, some people in this in this well, in this very church are going to die in the next year and have lose jobs and or children or whatever. And well, it's, I think it's one thing to philosophically sort of ponder it for yourself, but it can feel callous when you're saying it to somebody who is suffering it in pain. And I think right. priests are, well, they are good fathers who recognize that you can't just callously go around telling people who are suffering, hey, you know, whatever, bad things happen, suck it up. R right. Which is what it, can, what it can sound like when you are in the midst of suffering. Right. But that's not what it is. No. I, I, I'm kind of reacting against this health and wealth gospel sort of attitude that you find even along, among a lot of Catholics, which is, why did a bad thing happen to me? I'm a good person. I'm a good Christian. God never, like, <laughs> see how God loves the people, you know, treats the people he loves. He crucified, the father had to let the son be crucified, <laughs> you know, yeah, but there was still a resurrection. You know, the resurrection was the, was the thing. You're right. Like I would, I would never go up to someone who's suffering and say, "Well, you know, why are you upset? Don't be upset." I, I mean, God bless you know poor Kathleen and her husband and her, their children. I would never say something like this to them. I'm thinking more at saying to myself, right? Exactly. This is something I say to myself, which is, "Why are you so terrified of like?" Because I, I, I mean, honestly, I, I, I get afraid of what if something bad happened to you? What if that bad something bad happened to one of the kids? I know, just because. I, I, I'm a Catholic and I practice sacraments and I try to do all, all God's will and I'm very much aware of God's will in my life. That doesn't protect me from bad things happening. Every good person has had people they love die and had right. sadness to their lives and all that sort of stuff. And, and I don't think it protects us from the end. Our faith protects us from the internal storms either, because no matter how strong our faith is, when those moments happen, we still have to go through the internal turmoil we have to wrestle with it i mean it's it's easy when you're in a time of peace and calm to think 
oh, the storms aren't that bad. But the fact is that when you're in the midst of a storm, it's always terrifying. Yes. It's no matter how strong your faith is. You're always with the apostles who are who are freaking out. I mean, right. Freaking out is human. It is. It is what we it's are. Our natural state. <laughs> <laughs> right hair on fire running around crazy <laughs> and yet i think god is patient with us in our freaking out he sets limits but he allows us to have those moments of of terror like it's he he accepts our terror as not it's not a contrary to his will for us to be scared for us to be angry for us to question sad yeah we can those out. are those are all within his plan for what it means to be human. It, yeah, it's it's quite a right to yell at God and say, I don't understand. Why is this happened? This is bad. He, he, he could take it. <laughs> He's a big dude. He could take it. It reminds me of when Sophie would have her night terrors as when she was four or five or six. And I'd be sitting in here in the office with her and she'd be pounding on my chest. You know, bad daddy, take me back to my room. I'm like, yeah, you're not going anywhere. So you stop screaming. You're not going to wake everybody up. I set a limit. I barred the door. Right. For her own good and for the good of the family. And um, I think looking forward, you know, I know that, of course, we're going to have bad things happen in our own lives in the future. And I, th I guess sort of balancing out the like, I know God will be with me in those moments. I also know that I might not feel like it at yeah. those times. It's I guess it's comforting to me to know that. Right. It's OK if we don't feel like faith is there in those moments of of terror. Right. Because ultimately what I feel doesn't matter because God's mercy is still there regardless. Like he's he's there sleeping in the boat. Right. All right. Let's uh, I think that should do it for that. Um, and wrap things up B before we do. I want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create Raising the Bets, including Zach B, Ed M, Michael F, Shiloh S, and Michael P. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Raising the Bets and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So that's it from us. If you have any feedback for us, you can do so. Uh, send it to us at sqpn.com slash bets. That's B-E-T-T-S. Or the SQPN Facebook page, facebook.com slash starquestmedia. Or send an email to bets at sqpn.com. And any relevant links, including links to the books that we talked about in the shows, will be in our show notes on sqpn.com. Please write a review of the show at Apple Podcasts. We haven't had a review in a long time, and it really helps to get reviews on Apple Podcasts, Podcasts as it gets the show out in front of other people. Shows that get reviewed get bumped in the algorithm and all that sort of jazz. Also, share the podcast with your friends. Help us grow this community and reach more listeners. So until next time, I'm Dom Bettinelli. And I'm Melanie Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Raising the Bets on StarQuest.